here doesn't want to be an innovator? Put up your hands if you do not want to be an innovator. Great, I'm in the right place, fantastic. <laughs> because I think as we heard from all the people we saw today, there is always room for innovation, there is always room for innovators, and innovators and innovation can be found anywhere. You heard David speaking about how he dealt with an intractable problem. Everyone, Pooja and her issues and how she solved for it. And today what I would like to do is just sort of run you through what it takes to innovate. Some of the toolboxes you need and the processes that you have to think about. But basically you heard it already today. I'm just going to make it a little bit easier for you. So, do you have what it takes to be an outlier? Um, because that is what it does take to innovate. By definition, innovation means to think where no one else has thought before, <coughs> solve where no one else has thought before. For that to happen, you have to be an outlier. Now, this is tricky. It's an intelligence test, and I want you all to take it. All right? We're going to run this. I don't know if you can run it. Do you know how to do it? OK. Now, for it starts, watch very carefully. I want you all to be able to answer the question. Look carefully at the white team, and I want you to know how many times they pass the ball. All right? This is an intelligence test. OK. Let's see if we can do it. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did you count? Eight. The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see did the gorilla? Did you see the gorilla? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Don't worry. 50% of people do not this video see is the gorilla. By Daniel. All right. 50% of people don't see it. Okay, so you're, you're going to be absolutely fine because that, what that means is that everyone has their own different reality. Right? We've actually heard that from every single speaker that we've heard in different ways today. If everyone has their own reality, if they see things differently, then for an innovator that is manna to the gods because if there are multiple realities, then there are multiple potential solutions. And that, for an innovator, opens you up, opens your mind to a whole new realm of capability. Okay, so we're talking about outliers. All right, this, we all know, is a bell curve. We've got high school grades. We've got disruptive innovations. Right, now, let's just look at it. High school grades, Einstein, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, all basically failed at school. <coughs> Bad grades, all right. Then there's Marjorie Duffy from my high school. She was brilliant. She just outclassed all of us. All right. And then there's me sort of in the top of the class. Now we go down to disruptive innovations. Marjorie Duffy, not there. Not there. You know, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, absolutely. There's me. I'm there because I do develop disruptive uh, innovation, oh, disruptive technologies and the innovations. There's another reason why I'm an outlier. Can you guess what it is? I'll tell you. It's because I'm female. Uh, I'm not kidding. There are very few female innovators that are actually recognized for their innovations. Now, I want you to think about that very hard because as we go through the laundry list of what it requires, is required to be an innovator, you will see that actually women rock it, all right? But you'll also see that we don't promote it nearly as much as we should. Okay. Innovation. If it's not about good grades, what is it about? Well, actually, innovation is a state of mind. And you heard that also from David and his family, from Pooja. It's, it's just a way of looking at the world, a way of engaging with the world. It's not an occupation. It's not a career. 
It's a way of engaging with the world. It's a state of mind. So everyone can be an innovator. Okay. So also, what is innovation? It is, as we all know, it's, it's, the, it's about problem solving. But it's about the joy of problem solving. For me, I love problems. You got a problem? Give it to me. I love it. And it's also interesting because it's quite different from a puzzle. Right. A jigsaw puzzle, for example, or a crossword puzzle. People often say that, oh, if you like doing puzzles, then you're going to be a great innovator. No, not necessarily. And here's the reason why. Jigsaw puzzles have rules. Jigsaw puzzles have just one correct answer. Same with crossword puzzles. So you go into it knowing that there's an answer there somewhere. There's going to be a correct one, and you follow the rules, you should be able to get it. All right? Problems, not the case. Problems could have no answer. Problems, if correctly framed, need not just have no answer, they could have, need not just have one answer, they could have a multitude of potential answers. The other thing about problems, <coughs> no rules except what you create as you go along. And for me, as a person who naturally doesn't like rules, I love that because I can then generate my own set of rules. I do have one set of rules when I innovate. That's my personal set of rules. I do not rob from others, and I do not rob from the future. That means the environment, you know, young people, etc. So that's, that's a very personal one. So problem solving. The other thing that problems have are these things called constraints. Now, a long time ago, I used to be an architect. So it's quite easy to be able to explain it in the, in the terms of being an architect. When you are given a project, you're asked to you know, design a fantastic house, you know, you know, do whatever you want. But you can't ever do whatever you want. There's going to be site restrictions, you know, the particular peculiarities of the site. There are going to be clients, oh my god, with all their needs and wants. There are going to be regulators and laws and all these different things. So there are always constraints to any given problem. So you always have to solve for them. Now, this, this is just a list. Right, there are usually a lot more, there can be a lot more, but usually it's either there are technological restrictions or constraints, economical, political, societal, we heard about it today, where even just the way that you think is going to dictate your answer and your limitations on an answer. Legal, regulatory, my goodness, especially when it comes to biotech, that's a major area, because usually when you're talking about innovation in biotechnology, if you're truly out there, then the rules haven't been written yet. The tests haven't even been developed yet. So you actually have to be able to do all of that. And that's what I want to talk to you about, is that as an innovator, you have to be able to think in so many different ways. You can't just be you know, laser focused in one particular area. And there's this one chap called Michael, Michael or someone, Gladwell, whatever his name is, um, who said that to be um, an outlier, you have to have 10,000 hours of work when you're six years. Old or something like that. Well, not really, no. If you want to be a hockey player, yes. Um, but if you want to truly innovate and create disruptive innovations, then you have to have a truly global view on things. Oh, the last one there, just, we can keep it there anyway. And the last one there was when you've got a list of constraints that have just involved everything, all of that, all of those constraints. And to me, that is where I love to be, where it is just too hard for everyone else to even bother about it, just too complicated. I love that. To me, that's just like fresh powder snow on a glorious mountain uh, in, in, in wintertime in Niseko. That's just, that's just fantastic to me. Um, it's where angels fear to tread. And usually there are really strong emotional, uh, societal restrictions to a particular area, very, very controversial. I like to strip that apart and I like to be able to deal with it. Um, now, innovation is a process. Innovation, you can have a toolbox for dealing with it, and that's great. Do you know why? Because it means every single one of you can do this. This is not difficult. It's a process. So it's not too hard for you to think about here. You have to, first of all, identify a worthwhile problem to solve, which sounds quite easy, but actually, a lot of people find it very difficult. <laughs> Secondly, root cause analysis. You're all boffins here, so you understand what I mean by that. A root cause analysis means that you get down to the bare essentials of what is causing the issue in the first place. 
and you have to question everything. An outlier is a person who challenges. You do it respectfully, but you challenge. You always ask questions. Um, and then you've got to come up with what I call a range of systemic solutions. You can't just solve for one particular issue. You've got to solve for all those constraints. You've got to find the gaps. You've got to fill the gaps. You've got to address all of the constraints. And then you can say that you've got something that is disruptive. Finally, you need to test and refine. That seems easy, but oftentimes, as I said, if you've got something disruptive, you don't even have the tests out there. There's nothing that can even record your capability. So you have to think about that too. And then the last one is implement. Implementation is where you start crossing over into being an entrepreneur, all right, which we will discuss on another time. But, uh, but that in itself, we'll also use this toolbox here on the site. First of all, the ability to see. You just saw when we saw that video, that, and also we heard from, from, uh, from the other speakers tonight, that if you are able to see and see multiple realities, step inside other people's shoes to see what, how they see, to empathize, then you are already well on your way to being able to innovate and find really, truly new solutions to intractable problems. Um, you have to be able to imagine, of course. You have to say, what if? And you have to be able to ask, what if? Uh, to any specialist that you can think of in that particular area. You don't have to be a specialist in, in that area. I ended up running a biotech company and innovating in biotech. I'm a lawyer. I'm an architect. Right? I'm not an a, a, a infectious disease specialist. But you can understand it and you can just take it apart, take it down, from, uh, down to first principles, deconstruct and reconstruct. Anyone can do it. So, range of solutions, uh, sorry, uh, challenge, harness, harness, harness resources. You need money, you need expertise, you need all different things. So you have to have that ability to harness um, the resources around you. Experiment, obviously, but most people don't. We just heard about it today. Again, every single one of the speakers has ended saying, go out there, have an adventure. Go out there, experiment, try it, um, adjust, because you'll come into a whole range of different issues and problems as you, as you start to solve the big problem. So you have to know to adjust, but you also have to know your endpoint when you're adjusting. Um, you need to be able to convince. If you've got a truly amazing new technology, if you truly have a disruptive technology, then you're going to be going up against a whole bunch of big players who don't want to know about it because you're going to be challenging the way that they think, the way that they do their business, etc. So you have to have an ability to convince others um, about why it's going to work. And hopefully, if you solve for all those constraints, you can find the way to be able to do that. Um, you have to collaborate, teamwork. You know, I've come up with many different types of innovations. But of course, it's teamwork, because as I said, I'm a lawyer, I'm an architect, I'm not an infectious disease specialist, um, and you'll see I'm not an electronics specialist, but that doesn't mean that I, I, I won't try and work with other people uh, to realize my vision. You have to conquer, oh my goodness, you just have to push through things. And then finally, you absolutely have to learn, which goes to the next point, knowledge, imagination and knowledge. But the more you know about the world, in every single kind of thing, whether you're spending time at crossroads and truly understanding what it's like to be poor or, or challenged, um, or if you're, you know, you know, go off uh, mountain climbing or whatever it is that you do, go out there and experience the world because you need experience and you need knowledge to be able to draw that in and connect the dots uh, to create disruptive technologies and, of course, determination. All right, so we're going to talk about oh, that first issue. Oh my gosh, what if I come up with a problem? What is, what is a worthwhile problem? It's always, you know, oh, I want to be the next, you know, Steve Jobs. Oh, I've, I've got all the toolbox, I'm all dressed up. I've, you know, I've got all those things that are listed there. I know the process, but I don't have a good problem. Well, I can't say that it's necessarily easy. A lot of people actually stumble here. They stop, they come to a screeching halt, and they stop. But there are different ways you can define it, you, or you can grasp it, or, or, or um, corral it. 
usually necessity. That's why I go out and, and spend time at crossroads. Understand what necessity really means. Um, desire for money, desire for fame, uh, desire to improve society, which is going to be my main one that I will try and push out for you. Because actually, if you solve for all constraints and you're also gunning to uh, improve society, I bet you'll be able to make a business out of it and you'd be pretty hard pressed if you couldn't figure that one out. All right. Just to win, there's a lot of competition in the market. There's a lot of competitions that are you know, put into place because there's no competition in the market. But that sometimes also drags people into being innovators. And the other one is just cause. And that's also, I think it's between improving society and just cause that it's me. Because for me, nothing is static. For me, I see the world almost like the matrix. I see cause and effect everywhere. And you need to understand the cause and effect of anything to be able to understand, understand where the gaps are. Because when you chase the gaps, and when you find the gaps, and you solve for the gaps, of course, you have to go where no one else is. If you're chasing the gaps, then that is absolutely where you're going to find your next uh, point of innovation. For me, an object has a history. It has a range of actualities. We've, we've talked about that, that you can have multiple realities, and a whole range of different possible futures. And so it's be about being able to harness that. So I'm always thinking, I'm always questioning, and I'm always innovating. It's just the way that I am, and that's why I innovate across multiple areas, whether it's um, in the ones that I've just discussed, or if it's for founding a, an organization called Pathfinders, which is very similar to what Puja is doing, and also Crossroads, where we see there is, you know, our absolute points of needs, absolute gaps, and we go in there and solve it. For Pathfinders, it's dealing with the undocumented women and children here in Hong Kong, usually migrant women and children, the people who have no voice uh, and no rights. And so we fight for them. So, um, I'm going to give a couple of examples, and I'm going to whiz through them relatively quickly. But for example, in 2008, I read a Lancet report saying there are going to be 83 million Chinese are going to die in the next 30 years from pre preventable deaths. Preventable deaths. Um, and when I looked at it and I looked into it, 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 it became clear to me. It just was simply because they lacked non-toxic, affordable, accessible heat and light sources. If I could solve for that, then I could save 83 million people potentially from dying and all of the, the poverty that goes along, and the cycle of poverty that goes along with that. So this is the analysis here that I did. Turns out they had no electricity, all right? Either too poor to afford it or no access in poor areas to electricity. That then drove the, the children who were desperately trying to escape poverty, uh, studying to inhale toxic fumes from their paraffin lamps at night. And of course then the, poor, the women who are also poor are having to cook with coal fires and they're inhaling that as well and killing themselves. And then we have the men who are off to work uh, killing themselves and their family with cigarettes. You know, in China it's a huge issue, it's largely from, from ignorance and also just their very, very poor working conditions. Um, and also it fed money away, it took mo siphoned money away from the family as they're paying for their cigarettes. And then of course TB, tuberculosis, which kills the men in their crowded conditions and it, they bring it back into the home and kills the, the mothers and the children. And it goes largely unchecked. 83 million Chinese deaths that would be preventable as a result of this. And I realized that these were, they were dying because they were poor, right? And they were dying because they were struggling not to be poor. So the actual struggle them itself was killing them. So what can we do to, to solve for this? And I, oh, sorry, just before we go there, all those constraints, ugly. Ugly, ugly, ugly. Or a whole list of all these nasty constraints, economics being one of them. So, it's quite simple. I'm not an electronics person, but I just came up with this solar powered charger and lamp. The lamp, uh, if you go onto the next page, very, very, it's a systemic solution. So, the, the, the lamp provided clean studying area uh, for the children, so they're not. Uh, poisoning themselves, and they're actually able to get an education, and education, as you know, uh, breaks disease. Education also breaks poverty, so that's good. Then what I did with the charger is that I wanted the charger 
to be used by women as a micro business. Who knows about micro credit lending and, and that concept, right? Yeah, exactly. So we would give them this device. It would look after itself. It's not a cow where you have to feed it or anything. It would just needs the sun. They would then be able to, uh, you know, charge their community for charging up their phones and their laptops, which is fantastic because, of course, these women are living in areas where there is no electricity. So I knew there was demand for it. Um, and so, of course, if the community is using more phones and laptops, then they're getting educated, um, etc. And then, of course, it put less work uh, uh, and pressure on the men. So it released them from uh, a lot of their, the issues that they uh, were bringing home. And, of course, women would be able to buy better stoves. But it wasn't a full solution until I found, could find a way for making it work economically. Because who's going to give these lamps to the women? And the solution was right out there. I used to be in, in, an investment banker, so I used to work in the TMT sector, in the telecom sector. So I rocked up to uh, uh, China Mobile and I said, listen, why don't you give away for free these uh, solar-powered lamps and chargers to the women in these communities? And you're going to get a couple of really important things as a result of it. They are going to be able to charge their phones, etc., so more minutes will be used, and that's where you get your money from, is from selling minutes of uh, telecom time. Um, you're going to get your brand on there, so that you're going to get all that goodwill value of having your brand in everyone's home and you being a lifesaver. It's absolutely a, an, an absolute customer loyalty as a result of it. So they did. They're the ones that brought it to the women for free, so that then these women would be able to break the cycle of poverty. And as a result of this, who knew, but uh, the British Museum, along with the BBC, voted that technology to be of the 100 objects that define human history, object number 100. Because it breaks that one simple device. If the innovation wasn't in the device, it was in the systemic solution that it provided in breaking poverty, the cycle of poverty and disease. Um, so along with the Rosetta Stone <laughs> is my little solar lamp, which is kind of hilarious to me, but I, I certainly appreciate that they appreciate the systemic thinking that went behind it. This is another one, and I'll just do, we talked about it briefly, was, which was the biomass. So it's about looking at the pr world around you and saying, no, you know, we can do better. We can do better. And this was in SARS in 2003. Um, at this point, I was not an infectious disease specialist. I knew all about tobacco-related diseases, um, but I did not know anything about uh, viruses and bacteria, etc. But I saw how we were all killing ourselves over these medical face masks, which actually, in fact, had the potential of killing us and others. They harbored and captured and delivered viruses. You think about it. Your mask is just going to be a vehicle for capturing viruses, and we touch it, and then we hand it off to someone else and touch other things, etc. They're unbreathable, so you know you end up not wearing them properly anyway. And worst of all, they didn't actually filter out viruses because viruses are tiny. And the weave in most masks are about the size of a football field to a virus. So for a virus to be able to pass through an ordinary face mask is just it's a walk in the park, literally. And so Yet we were engaging in dangerous behavior, thinking we were getting protected by these face masks, which made it all the more dangerous. So I said to my team, hey, you know, we know nothing about this particular area, but I want to be able to come up with a mask that actually works. Because when it comes to a pandemic, you don't know what the next, next virus is going to be. You won't have any drugs to save you. You won't have any cures. So we need something to be between us and the next pandemic. So we did it. And um, we did the impossible. They said it would be impossible for us to be able to do it, but we did it. Um, and not only did we do it, but we are now the first and only Chinese company to be able to get a new category of medical devices awarded to us by the US FDA, which is considered the, the, the gold seal. Um, and we were able to get claims that no one else was able to be able to achieve. And just to to, to give you a little idea about the types of thinking that's involved in it, which is why you should never fear anything, because if I can do this, anyone else can do this. 
basically, we, full, we looked at how viruses, there are universal elements to all viruses, they have a very potent weapon, which is their ability to lock themselves onto human host cells. They actually can detect the presence of a human host cell, and then they just move themselves onto it and lock themselves on. So that was a very potent weapon. Well, you know, we looked at, before we talked about the processes, etc., and understanding where all the gaps are in a system. And of course I thought, well, why don't we just turn that weapon against the virus? So that's what we've done. We actually fool the virus into thinking it's binding the sialic acid receptors on the outside of all human host cells, so that when it's coming, comes near the face mask, it locks itself onto the face mask, and that sets up a chain reaction that then gets it killed very quickly and very completely. Um, and that's why we were able to win the accolades uh, that we've been able to win on that. And say between, by the way, when there's the next pandemic, and there will be one, fortunately, we've got a large stockpile here in Hong Kong, so you're all welcome on that. All right. So, next, next, next. So, innovation, by definition, means that you have to have an outlier approach. You have to think differently. Um, and you, the, the, the real outlier aspect of it is pushing yourself to the limit. You heard even Jan talking about that for investment banking and also in his first, uh, his first venture, is that you have to work hard and you have to push yourself as far as you can possibly go. So, so next one. So, in summary, in your toolbox, learn to empathize. Step in other people's shoes and you'll see more. You see more, see more realities, more potential solutions. Frame the problem so that you've got more outcomes available to you. Question everything. Try and do it nicely, but do question everything. Understand your constraints. Seek systemic solutions. Dare to imagine. Mm. Gain knowledge and experiment. So, again, next one there is dare to be different. All right? Rejoice in being different, but please make it count. If you're going to go out there and innovate, please also make it so that you're improving society. And you can do it at any level, whether you're a secretary, whether you're an investment banker, it doesn't matter whether you're a lawyer, etc. Innovate, improve society. And along with Pooja, I have a, a very special request to all the women out there. As I said before, we actually rock on all of those elements. We're actually really good at innovating. Look at what we are able to do just on a daily basis. All right? And we're also great at empathizing. So we're actually super, super, super capable of being, do of being innovators. So my special message to you in particular is to innovate and be proud of it. And then just to everyone, there is no one reality. So make your own and make it count. Yes.